We'd also like to thank our sponsors. We have um, folks that are dedicated to sponsoring the educational series with SBC, and that's the School of Business Administration at the University, Missoula Federal Credit Union, Livesey All Freight Systems, Balance Tech, and Missoula Independent. So we really thank them for um, coming together and sponsoring this lecture series. Um, and we'd also like to thank MCAT for doing the filming. Um, they do that um, gratis for us. And then, of course, you can catch these uh, riveting lecture series on MCAT for the next two, three weeks they play. So we really thank them for coming and doing that. Um, the SBC is an organization, we're a member-driven organization, and our mission is to help build a network of businesses that embrace a clean and vibrant local economy. And we like to think that we're going to base that clean and vibrant local economy on renewable resources and um, living wages and really flourishing uh, local businesses. So we're really happy to have Robin here tonight. He's going to be talking about our recent uh, greenhouse gas inventory that he is spearheaded. So without further ado, oh, uh, one logistical item. If you need to use the restroom, <laughs> I'll be in the back, and I will escort you upstairs through, through a labyrinth of uh, <laughs> hallways to the restroom. So um, we, they don't want us running around upstairs. So Robin Saha is Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at the University of Montana, and his expertise is in environmental justice and policy analysis. He teaches classes on environmental policy, climate change, and environmental citizenship. And he's also on the faculty of UM's Climate Change Studies Program and a member of UM's Sustainable Campus Committee. Professor Saha and his students in UM's Environmental Studies Program recently completed a greenhouse gas emissions inventory for the city of Missoula. And that's what he's here to talk about tonight uh, with us. So please help me welcome Robin. Great, thank you Lisa and the board members of uh, Sustainable Business Council. It's great to be here and thank you all for coming tonight too. Um, I'd like to start out by uh, just giving you a little bit of a um, uh, story about how I got here or what I'm doing here. And you know, there's a lot of levels to that question of course and I've been trying to figure out the answer to that for quite some time. So I'll just give you one layer of that answer. Um, but, um, and you know, I was trying to figure out how did I get involved on the way over here, how did I get involved in doing a greenhouse gas inventory for the city of Missoula? And I tell you the truth, I, I can't remember. Um, but I, I do know that there's been tremendous interest in the city government, in uh, members of the environmental community, the business community, in trying to confront this problem at a local scale. Uh, it's obviously a global problem. Uh, people wonder, well, what can we do at the local level? And um, we might also ask, what are we doing or not doing at the local level? How are we contributing to uh, climate change and what are our emissions? And that's something that no one seemed to have an answer to. And that's the basic question that we were trying to find out is what is the baseline emissions, at least for um, the city of Missoula's municipal operations. And so that's what our inventory was, was geared towards looking at. And I think, um, you know, there's a couple of reasons to do that, obviously. Uh, one being that uh, the city of Missoula um, belongs to the U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement, and that sets out a whole set of um, steps that cities uh, ha are committed to, to undertaking to get a handle on their contributions and what they might be able to, to do about them. So, uh, you know, interest in climate change goes back quite a while here in Missoula, and um, I don't have any particular background or um, special expertise in conducting uh, emissions inventories. And in fact, when I went and tried to find out who does, um, I found out that no one does, and that um, everyone was just sort of making it up as they, they went along. Um, now, that doesn't mean you're making up the figures. It means that you're counting things very carefully, but then what you count and how do you count it becomes a big question. So, um, now I do have some uh, background in energy policy analysis and worked a little bit on uh, California's energy crisis back in uh, the early 2000s when um, there was a major shortage and it turned out to be um, a, fabric, a sort of a manipulated uh, energy crisis that um, uh, raised uh, rates quite a bit. And so I worked on a project with the Latino Issues Forum 
But most of my work is in environmental justice and looking at um, toxic hazards and um, the distribution of those using GIS, um, using exposure modeling data, um, using census data as well, and combining all those. And so um, I like crunching numbers. I like numbers. I'm not afraid of them. And uh, uh, I had a group of students that I tried to convince numbers were great um, to work with. And so um, we started this uh, in January of 2009 and thought we were going to be done in May. And I just delivered the report to the mayor this week. So um, I never knew what I was getting into. And if I had, I probably uh, wouldn't be here asking my, myself, why am I here, right? You're telling me why I'm here. So um, OK, well, why don't we uh, lay out the, the battle plan here. Uh, what I'm going to be covering is uh, you know, just a short history of climate change in Missoula, um, what we've done so far, uh, where the interest has come from, who's been involved. Uh, I'll tell you about the Missoula Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory that we conducted. And um, we you know, basically uh, inventoried all uh, municipal emissions from municipal operations. I'll explain what that means. And um, when you look at something like that, when you're looking at um, greenhouse gas emissions from municipal operations, municipal operations, you're mainly looking at use of energy. And energy is really at the heart of our climate crisis that we have, the global climate crisis that you know, my colleague Steve Running has, has really helped um, inform us about uh, for, for quite a few years now. And so uh, energy powers you know, our homes. It keeps us comfortable inside. It helps us get around when we're outside. It helps um, provide uh, the, for the infrastructure that allows us commerce and all that to take place. So when we're talking about addressing climate change, we're talking about addressing fundamental systems that go deep into the heart of, of society. So um, it's a formidable task then to to track down all those energy uses. And um, if you came here hoping that I would tell you what um, Missoula's emissions are, I'm not going to today because I'm not allowed to. I think what I need to do with this because the mayor of Missoula, John Engen, requested this report. Um, it's, being deliver it's been delivered to him. He needs to be the one that shares it with all of you. So he's asked me to speak about it in general terms until um, they've had a chance to review it and you know, so I don't have emissions data to share with you. And um, this would not be the first time I've been accused of uh, a sin of emission. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my big joke. I'm glad you got it. And um, in any case, um, uh, <laughs> what can we do about these issues? If you believe that we can do something, I believe we can. Um, that's what the heart of this report is, is saying, yes, we have a problem. Here are the numbers. If we're going to get further along, we need to start um, bringing, bringing that curve back down and um, reducing our emissions. And here are some strategies to do that. Um, why should we do it? I'll talk about that. And we'll talk about how local solutions to climate change can be thought about or fit into a larger uh, framework of sustainability for the city. I do want to say, too, that for cities taking on this, it's a very um, important leadership role for cities to, to, to fulfill. And that in uh, showing that, uh, that it can uh, put the energy and the resources into um, monitoring and tracking its emissions, it can also set the example for businesses, for residents, and for the larger community. So I think. Um, even though the city of Missoula may not, uh, its emissions may, may pale in comparison, say, to just to the University of Montana, um, that it still matters. And um, University of Montana has gone forward already, and um, that's one reason I was stupid enough to get into this project, is I had helped with the greenhouse gas inventory at the University of Montana. And so um, there is a building uh, network of folks that have expertise and resources and things to bring to this. And I'm sure there's some in the room here that have things to bring to this whole discussion. So um, Missoula's climate change milestone 
In uh, 1996, uh, Mayor Dan Chemis um, signed a resolution that had gone through city council um, bringing Missoula into the Cities for Climate Protection campaign, which was part of uh, the International uh, mm -hmm. Council for Local and Environmental Initiatives a project. And at that time, there were only maybe 200 cities in the world that were involved in uh, this uh, campaign to try to uh, make citizens more aware of uh, impacts uh, that their activities and their municipal activities have on the environment and um, to begin to, to, to do something about that. And uh, I'll explain what the framework is. Uh, there's five milestones in that. And um, in 19, or 2004, uh, Missoula uh, released its uh, greenhouse gas and energy efficiency plan and that was a product and at the same time formed the Greenhouse Gas Energy Conservation Team, which is a subcommittee of the Conservation Committee and City Council. So uh, we start to see a development of um, institutional capacity, um, of um, information and resources and tools for addressing climate change and energy conservation and efficiency coming um, to bear. And it's a great report. It's a historic report and it really laid out um, a blueprint that I think we can, we can build on and that has a lot of a lot of good information in it. It did a really quick and dirty estimate of um, emissions in Missoula, and uh, Ben Schmidt was one of the people that, that helped spearhead that. And um, what distinguishes our inventory is we really do look hard at a lot of data. And so it's a little bit more comprehensive, and then it's only pertaining to um, municipal operations versus the other one was for the whole city. So in 2007, then, um, Mayor Engen signed uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors Climate Protection Agreement. And next. And what that sets out is um, a whole, uh, uh, well, first some background on it. It, was, it. it began really in 1990 um, at a meeting of the UN, uh, at the UN in New York, and has since um, involved over 1,000 local governments around the world and Missoula is part of it. Um, there's other cities in Montana that are also part of the mayor, signed on to the mayor's climate protection agreement, including our, our peer cities of Bozeman and Helena, and um, also Red Lodge, Montana is one. Uh, the framework consists of these five uh, milestones for local governments to achieve emission reductions. And uh, you know, it's like that Biggest Loser show. I don't watch it, but I know, you know when you're flipping through, that there's a big scale there, right? The biggest loser, just they couldn't have that show without a scale, right? It just wouldn't work. So same thing with emission reductions. You need to have a baseline inventory. These are the five milestones. You first, you conduct an emissions inventory and analysis to see not only how many emissions you're producing, but where they're coming from. And uh, if you're fancy enough, um, how, what the rate of increase is from various uh, sectors. Um, you establish then a re emission reduction target, or it could be um, even just a emission stabilization target. You might say, well, look, um, we're not going to planning on reducing our emissions, but we'd like to have them flatten out if they're, if they're on an uphill trajectory. Um, then how do you get there? How do you do that? Uh, well, you engage a public process. Um, and in Missoula, we love to have things out in the open and debate them and um, that's what would have to happen here probably to take those next steps. So I wanted to just point out that, you know, what we're doing is really at the, just the very beginning in some ways and that a climate action plan with uh, a set of uh, measures that would uh, be implemented then would be the next step followed by monitoring the progress and reporting the results. What does it take to do these things? What does it take to do these things? Well, um, I don't know. but. If we want to do it, we need to figure it out. I have some ideas. I know what it takes to do step one. This shows where we stack up uh, in the five um, milestones. Uh, Helena, Bozeman, and the University of Montana have all gone to step three and um, have done their climate action plans already. In Bozeman, uh, they hired a full-time sustainability coordinator to do the work to coordinate it in Helena. Uh, there was a task force that was set up that had a number of working groups um, that brought together a lot of folks. And I don't know exactly how 
Uh, maybe Ben knows he was on that um, committee, but how that got staffed and, and funded, um, if people were just doing it pro bono, I don't know. Um, great reports, they're online. Um, I'm not sure how, where those cities are in terms of implementation. I do know that um, University of Montana, we just came out with our climate action plan in January and the president signed it. There's a different framework for universities called the American University President's Climate Commitment. And so um, UM is a signatory to that and um, we're in the process of implementing it, implementing it. Students agreed to essentially tax themselves $4 a semester to set up a revolving energy loan fund and I'm working with students now to develop projects that have um, no more than six year paybacks uh, that can um, pay back the loan fund from energy savings. So, you know, that's money going out the door that can go into to other things eventually once the loans are paid back. Um, next, so why, why should we care about what cities do? You know, we've got China out there, right? We've got India out there. We've got um, New York City and LA and Chicago and St. Louis and lots of really big cities. Well, you know, I guess um, the point is that uh, most people, vast majority of people in this country live in cities now. How they're designed, how they're uh, operated makes a big, big difference in terms of emissions. And um, it's been hard to get action on climate change um, in places like Washington, D.C. It's been hard to get a federal legislation. Um, and cities have um, an ability really to be more responsive. I mean, we don't think we get things done really quick here, but you know, uh, compared to other places, um, I don't know, let's not do any comparisons, except to you know, the federal government and the state government. Uh, and, and what is true is that cities can have the power to really affect um, emissions from their operations, but also from the public and private sector. Uh, they control uh, land use, um, they control transportation, um, have a great influence over uh, building uh, standards and design, over um, the wastewater treatment plant, the imp plants, the infrastructure, delivery of water and other services, um, in some places, um, waste management as well. And um, those are big, those are those things that Obama talks about as being things we have to work on together and we can't just have them you know, everyone have their own landfill, you know, okay? We can't have everyone have their own waste management um, plant. Um, did I, can you go back one quick sec? Um, so local governments have, you know, this ability to, to be leaders. Um, they can um, take a leadership role in building public-private partnerships in, in carrying out these um, efforts through planning and decision-making. Um, climate mitigation doesn't happen, though, without a real, um, invest, a real investment and real um, uh, coordinated effort. So um, they can make a difference and they are making a difference. Thank you. Um, now, just some facts. I know I didn't have promised, I said I wouldn't have figures, but I wanted to have at least some. And um, that Montana, you know, we're very spread out and we're also an exporter of energy. So we have a higher per capita um, emissions than the rest of the country. And, um, you know, when you start grappling with 25 metric tons, that's, you know, two, over 2,000 pounds. So you're talking 50,000 pounds of carbon dioxide. Now, you know, if you were to lift that up or, you know, try to throw it out the window, that would be a lot of work, you know. But that's essentially what we do somehow uh, per person. Um, estimated to have increased 14% per year. And so that's, um, some that increase is, is kind of on par with, with what the rest of the country is doing. Yeah. Is that municipal? Like the local That's the that whole community? shebang. That's the whole shebang. That's the whole community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. So this is for the whole state. And um, so the net emissions for Montana are 11 million metric tons. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how much that means. In the report, I've uh, we, we report them in metric tons of CO2 equivalencies, and I've also translated those into um, Subaru Outback equivalencies. Uh, so 
Um, in other words, the weight of a Subaru Outback, not the emissions from a Subaru Outback. That might get a little confusing. I've got to kind of look at the, whether that's going to work or not. But in any case, um, and it's a lot of Subaru Outbacks. Okay. Um, anyways, next. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we know what the global impacts are, and that's what the little figure down there is, is the melting uh, Eskimo. I was trying to find an image of the Eskimo sinking into the ice, but I couldn't find one of those. Uh, not the Eskimo, the, the polar bear. Um, so that's the best I could do. But um, to bring things closer to home, though, uh, the impacts in Montana are really being felt already. Uh, you know, we are um, projected to see increases in mean temperature in the northern Rockies over the next century that are pretty, pretty substantial. And we can count on longer sum summers and shorter winters. And if you're a farmer, you know a farmer, a rancher, or if you just go outside, you'll know that that's happening and that we've had some of the, the hottest summers, um, hottest years um, on record in, in, the, in the 2000s, um, that these um, impacts um, are happening at a faster rate than nature is uh, able to adapt in many ways. And it does adapt, it changes. There's environmental change going on. Um, and there is a, sp a spread of insects. There's um, diseases, invasive species. Um, think about things like um, West Nile. Um, there's um, changes in animal populations as they move north, the birds, and um, damage to trees and crops. Um, increased risk of wildfires as well. So we are pretty familiar with some of these things, but um, the diminishment of snowpack um, over long periods of time, um, the decline of the glaciers uh, in, in Glacier and other places, it's ironic that, and I'm just having this conversation, that um, we talk about things happening at a glacial pace, and I think that doesn't mean the same thing it used to mean. Um, so uh, warmer air and water temperatures mean things too for the streams and rivers and the habitats of animals that live there. Uh, and um, now here's some things too, just in terms of um, impacts to uh, fish habitat that come from a number of studies that show that average annual air temperatures of increases of 1.8, remember Steve Running says we're, we're looking at you know, three, four to seven, um, would reduce suitable uh, trout habitat up to 16%. A nine degree increase would reduce trout habitat by 70%. So what does that mean too for our economy? What does it mean for our recreational and tourism industries? Well, according to the UM's Institute of Tourism and Recreational Research, tourism expenditures um, in 2007 supported about an estimated 45,000 jobs in Montana. That's an increase of 36%. So um, tourism economy in Montana is significant and it's, it's been growing rapidly. Will it continue to remain vibrant if um, we're, we really start to see our natural resources impacted? Um, tourism levels reached um, nearly 10.7 million in 2007, which doesn't sound that much to me, but um, I don't have a really a way of, of gauging that, but I suppose for small rural communities that re rely on that during their summer, it's, it's a bit, it is a big deal. Non-resident travel expenditures um, are increasing too uh, and are up to about four million in 2007. So um, there's more impacts too though to the recreational industry. Think about that Montana's tourism industry is the fifth largest employer in the state. Uh, and um, we've already been seeing closures of fisheries, uh, fish and streams by uh, fish, wildlife, and parks. So there's a threat then to the $31 million fish, um, uh, guiding fish, guided fish industry, the river recreation industry who outfitted nearly uh, 1,200, 12,000, 120,000 um, rafting trips is affected. I just, I'm sort of free and liberal with adding zeros or subtracting them. Um, uh, uh, but, I, but, but then I get it, I get it right eventually. Um, okay, 
Uh, Montana ski industry employs 1,100 people. And so all these in industries really have economic benefits to, to Missoula. Uh, so I wanted to just bring that back home. Okay, um, what were we trying to do with this inventory? We were, um, as I mentioned, trying to get a baseline to quantify emissions from the city, to identify uh, the major sources of emissions and um, the relative contributions within each sector, and to examine trends over time. So we used 2003, or fiscal year 2003, as our base. And we used 2003 because that was the last year that we could get really good records for. The city only keeps records for five years and then it destroys them. So um, there's a whole, we call it the dungeon underneath um, council chambers. There's a whole area where they store the records there and uh, the city clerk would go down there and the, uh, Mary Kay Wedgwood from finance and they'd, they'd drag things out and we'd look at them and then we'd enter data um, and uh, eventually figured out that there's a better way to do it. But, um, uh, you know, we have the dungeon story. Um, any case, um, to offer recommendations then, for municipal greenhouse gas emission reductions. We found that we could get electronic records from uh, Northwestern Energy, so that's what we did. Um, now, what did we include? We examined energy use, cost, and emissions from wastewater treatment. That's going on its own, right? <laughs> um, that's okay. Um, it, it was timed, I think, um, but it's faster than I can talk. Um, <laughs> but, no, 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 no. You're giving away all my surprises here. Um, so <laughs> wastewater um, treatment, uh, the wastewater treatment plant uh, obviously uses a fair bit of uh, energy, um, not only in um, the lift stations that have to um, pump uh, sewage uh, to the plant, um, but also the plan itself, and it was recently upgraded in 2004, I want to say, to meet water quality standards, um, to uh, enhance water quality standards. And so in actually helping the water quality of the Clark Fork River, we um, took on an added um, energy burden for that plant, and um, the digesters, the aerators, are um, considerable, use considerable chunks of energy. Um, it also um, captures, um, the system also generates biogas or methane and some other gases too. Um, and some of those gases, about half of them are captured and used in heating the plant. Um, so we did take those into account, not only the combustion of those gases, but then the ones that were just released um, and not um, captured. Uh, and And then there's just the, uh, you know, the heating and lights that go on at the, in the plant building itself. So um, there were something like 36, 37 Northwestern Energy accounts uh, related to, to the plant. Um, they also have um, energy accounts from the Missoula Electrical Co-op and Jefferson Electric for one year or the other, I forget which. Um, so operation of the municipal, 29 municipal built buildings. We included the Missoula uh, Art Museum, and we included parking commission buildings, parking garages, uh, and um, you know everything else, city hall, um, fire stations, uh, Scott Street, um, uh, the uh, council chambers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So cemetery. Um, learned a lot about what the city has going on, actually. On the municipal fleet, um, Jack uh, Stuckey was really helpful at that. There's over 500 um, vehicles and equipments um, in the municipal fleet. So that includes um, 330 vehicles. So um, fortunately, he has a system in place that we um, would like to see developed for all energy use in uh, the city uh, that um, tracks um, uh, fuel consumption, fuel purchases. So we had very accurate figures in terms of um, how many gallons of unleaded and uh, diesel were used. And there was um, also biodiesel for, um, for 2003, I believe. So there's a little chunk of biodiesel. We didn't take propane into account. We looked also at all outdoor lighting, including st street light districts, recognizing that, um, that the city general fund pays 
for 10% of those streetlight districts and that um, the rest, that other 90% is assessed to property owners. Um, just all electricity. We looked at water also um, that's used for municipal operations for streets, um, flushing fire hydrants, cleaning streets, um, also for parks, irrigation. Um, the, the electricity for, for running the irrigation comes in somewhere else and there's other category of other electrical accounts that we didn't, um, didn't count elsewhere. But what we're talking about here is the embedded energy in water. And this is a student that just wanted to follow this up. And um, so it's really mountain waters electrical use to deliver water for city operations. Now about half of the parks are metered, the city, the other half are not. The city is actually Mountain Water's lar largest flat rate customer. So, um, so we got some help from them in figuring out, okay, well, how much does it cost to pump that uh, water out of the ground and deliver it? And that was, that was all that was, was uh, calculated in that. Because we used our lowland, um, I can't remember the name of the figure, um, uh, rate. Um, it, in other words, uh, this is the rate for just having water delivery in the valley itself. If you deliver water to the South Hills or to the Rattlesnake, there's quite a bit more electrical um, electricity involved in delivering it there. So, um, but municipal operations are by and large on the flat. So that's. Um, ended up being point, I'll tell you that figure, 0.2% of emissions for the city. So what didn't really amount to much, but uh, yeah. Where do our aquatics complexes come in though? Uh, they come in in buildings. They come in in buildings and they were a pretty, pretty sizable chunk. And because they came online between 2003 and 2005, um, we did see a, a large increase in the building sector. Um, and we wanted to see whether or not, um, if you took those out, whether the rest of the buildings still were contributing and they, they were un increasing also. So, um, so you'll, you'll see those when the mayor uh, lets you see them. <laughs> um, all right, um, no, I'm just kidding. He, he's great and we've been, it's been a wonderful partnership working with the city. We could not have got this done without um, great cooperation and uh, it's been just a pleasure working with everyone that we've worked with. Um, so let's go on. What we did not include was solid waste. Um, we talked to Helena. They said they spent a lot of time figuring out exactly how many pounds of garbage were emptied from every city office. And it didn't amount to a lot because what, what you're mainly counting is just the transporting of those wastes to the landfill. And they, there wasn't a lot of organic waste to count um, methane that, com that com comes from uh, some waste. Um, Bozeman, interestingly enough, called their landfill a carbon sink when they did their um, uh, inventory, and they claimed that it was storing uh, carbon and that it was a, a dry landfill. Um, so, uh, you know, we kind of didn't want to sort through um, what was the best way to do it. If you wanted to, you know, you could look at the UM one, it, it was about 1 to 2 percent of their emissions. So, you know, we, we um, didn't count that, we underestimated. We're not counting energy and products consumed, so the paper that the city uses, um, the, um, the energy it takes to, say, make the um, paving material, it's not counted, or construct a new building, that's not counted. Energy associated with construction projects or performed by outside contractors, it's not counted. Agriculture, the University of Montana, when it did its one, it looked at fertilizer because that um, outgasses uh, nitrogen oxides into the atmosphere. That also didn't count for much. Urban forests, are those a source or a sink? That would require um, a lot of um, intensive work to determine uh, whether or not they're absorbing or, or contributing you know, with the leaves that rot and all that. So solar electricity generation, we did not consider. Uh, the fire, uh, two of the fire stations had solar, the city hall had solar, and they're not monitored, so no one knows really how much uh, benefit is coming from those. Uh, but we're saying that um, the next time around, you should count them as part of the city's energy and give yourself some credit for um, using a zero emission source. Um, okay, so um, the data sources, um, these are them. Uh, a lot of folks were involved, a lot of different departments in the city. 
Um, we also did a survey of employee of uh, city employees on their commuting behaviors. And um, if you want to go on, then uh, these are the students that participated in the project. And uh, Katie Makarowski, in particular, stayed on with the project after the class is over in May and has uh, worked on nearly every chapter closely with me since then and um, couldn't have done it without her help. And uh, she's um, now working for DEQ and has great technical writing skills. So um, she's real, real important uh, to getting this uh, to the finish line. Um, next. Um, so there was a tremendous amount of coordination with the city during this. We couldn't have done it without access to information that they had. We had numerous requests for information and a number of people were involved, probably 20 or 30 um, city employees helped with this and were really um, uh, uh, a big, uh, were just great to work with and were, were, um, uh, were great. So uh, we enjoyed that collaboration. We also got feedback in terms of the scope of the project from the mayor's administrative leadership team from various department heads. Uh, we presented it to the greenhouse gas um, committee too. We also um, presented it um, uh, to um, the mayor's advisory group on climate change and sustainability in May. Those are just the preliminary findings. And uh, we got feedback along the way, questions that came up. Each draft chapter went to um, uh, several uh, city uh, people that had worked on it for comment. And, and we responded to all those and made a lot of changes as a result of those. And so we're feeling uh, that it's um, a pretty good process now. It was a worthwhile process. Um, okay, so um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is that, well, okay, well, how do you translate um, kilowatt hours or decatherms or gallons of unleaded into carbon dioxide emissions? Um, there's a software that ICLE provides called the Climate um, or Clean Air and Climate Protection Software. And it uses, for electricity, it uses the um, grid intensity factor. So it looks at electric generation in our region. So it considers the Northwest region and, and considers the, uh, the generation, each of the sort of the, the distribution of, of, um, of electric, electrical generation in terms of the types of facilities. In other words, how much coal fired, how much hydro, how much natural gas, um, and uh, weights those such that you get um, a, good a fairly good estimate. Now, um, in Montana, we may not be getting, our electricity may be sourced a bit more from coal than from hydro than our region as a whole because of Bonneville Power in Washington, Oregon, they get a heck of a lot more hydro there. So our estimates, because they're regional, are probably an underestimate, really, of the emissions because we're using the Northwest uh, region grid intensity factor rather than one specific to uh, Montana. And we like to, and that's what other cities had done, and we wanted to have comparability with other cities. So um, that's another issue in terms of how do you do these things, and is there a better way to do them, a more accurate way to do them, and should we have some standards, should DEQ be giving us some guidance as cities for doing this? And I'll be getting in touch with them about that. So here's the number of Northwestern energy accounts in 2003 and 2008 that we uh, inventoried. Uh, so we looked at um, uh, kilowatt hours and aggregate amount of kilowatt hours and aggregate amount of, of um, decatherms from over 272 accounts uh, that the city, uh, they're billed to the city and they're billed like all over the place um, to different departments. And that what was so hard about going to the dungeon is you couldn't find them all. And so we figured out after a while we weren't getting them all. So we just asked Northwest. Uh, Vicki Judd of Northwest Energy was a big help and um, the mayor's office requested that we be um, release that information. And um, once we had everything built in the city, it, it just went um, real smoothly. So um, just to give you a sense of how other cities and other places have done these and uh, a, little, a little bit more of a teaser for you. Um, this um, shows um, in the first column the base year and the comparison year that the other um, communities have, have used. So they've all also gone back and had a base year to try to see what kind of um, changes are going on over time. 
Uh, so Bozeman looked at um, 2000 and 2006 emissions, Helena 2001 and 2007, UM at 2000 and 2007. Again, we did 2003 and 2008. So ours is really the most recent one of all of these, and, but it's also the, kind of the shortest time period too. Um, so this shows uh, the metric tons in their base year. It shows that Bozeman has increased uh, about 30% since um, over that uh, six year period, uh, an average annual increase of 5%. Helena has decreased its emissions due to um, installing a Sterling, help me out, a Sterling generator. They did something big at their wastewater treatment plant that um, helped them generate electricity that they could then use. So, and Sterling engine, thank you. I'm not um, an engineer, so I'm kind of learning about all these things, but um, so they've been decreasing their emissions. UM is on an uptick, and I'll just say that um, uh, without, because I can't give things away that, that we're, we're um, uh, um, we stand out. We stand out from these groups, <laughs> from these cities. <laughs> and um, they, they, they also, I mentioned before that they have their, their climate action plan, so they have an emission reduction target, and that shows you know, what the other cities are doing and what UM is doing. Um, the other cities are shooting for 15% reductions. Um, scientists say that we need to be doing 2% per year reductions, so that you know, just leveling off the curve is not good enough. We need to be bringing it down to avoid um, impairing the ability of natural systems to maintain life as we know it. So that's, I know, a little nebulous but and ominous sounding, but that's the truth. Um, that there will be profound change in our eco global ecosystems and our local and regional um, systems. There'll be uh, increases in extreme weather events, and you know we're already seeing those. So um, unless we bring it down, there's going to be really big price to pay to at, well, how we'll have to adapt building seawalls um, around our major cities. Um, figuring out how to deal with changes in agricultural production, where, where that's going to happen in irrigation, where that can be done, are going to be profound. So that's why reducing these emissions is so important. That's part of the reasons why UM is committed to 100% reduction by 2020. Um, so um, next, I want to finish up. I know we want to get um, onto questions and done. This at least doesn't tell you, you know, too much, but it shows you the um, where, the, where these emissions are coming from, what are the, what are the, what's the relative distribution of emissions from the different sectors we looked at. So you see that with the wastewater plant and the municipal buildings account for about 55% of emissions from the city operations and that um, the municipal fleet and the employee commuting are another big chunk followed by lighting and then the water and other um, miscellaneous accounts, um, irrigation and parks and whatnot. Um, was, a, was a much smaller chunk. So, you know, this suggests that if we're going to confront um, emissions in, in Missoula, if we want to as a community say this is something we need to grapple with, um, it's going to take um, strategies that, that um, uh, figure out where, where you can, where you can slice, slice at that pie and where you can maybe do so in the most sensible, cost-efficient manner, um, where you can achieve savings and um, in the process. So um, one of the things that I call, I'm calling Missoula's dirty little secret is that our emissions have been increasing rapidly um, over the last several years. And I, I did say that we're, we, we stand out. So you know you can read between the lines there. Um, oh, faster rate than other cities. I guess I, shouldn't have, I didn't need to be quite so nebulous. Um, but, um, and our rate outpaces our population growth and it outpaces Montana as a whole and the nation as a whole. So this is our dirty little secret. We consider ourselves um, a green community. We consider ourselves uh, you know, progressive and environmentally responsible. And we have a lot of great things we are doing. And we should feel good about those things. And I don't want the message to be that you're bad, Missoula. Um, we are good. We need to do a better job at being good. And I think that's the message I want to give. Um, OK. And um, just a reminder, too, that, that these emissions do contribute to um, uh, the threat and threaten the things that Missoulans value, our open space, our streams and rivers, our forests and parks, our outdoor recreation, 
and our local economies. So this is not just about an invisible gas. This is about things that really matter. Next. And um, the other thing is that um, you'll be seeing when the report comes out is that the cost of energy to city government are, are staggering. They're, they're increasing at a really, really rapid rate. And I think many households have seen this um, in that um, one thing that may be skewing it a little bit is that you know I think gas, gasoline prices were pretty high in 2008, um, but they'll be high again, you know. And even if um, uh, costs from fuel used for the municipal fleet may have decreased, and fleet fuel consumption may have decreased, which is great, that we're still um, using more electricity and more natural gas, and 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 those prices are also going up. So um, the energy costs to the city are unsustainable, and they're really undermining and forcing the city to choose between different services. And, um, and this is um, going to affect um, all of us unless we um, figure out ways to, to address it. Um, and the good news is that climate protection can actually help save energy and leave more funds for other purposes. And, um, and so these ideas of fiscal responsibility, of efficient government, and energy savings and climate protection are all mutually supportive goals. And um, next. And so what are some ways we can reverse those trends? There's about 10 um, major rec overall recommendations and then in our report. And then there are a number that are specific to each sector, wastewater, buildings, lighting, the fleet, et cetera. Um, but I think what I want us to, unless there's questions about those specific sectors, what I want us to think about is really how do we look at the big picture? How do we do the big things? And you know, we're, we're, everyone loves talking about the low-hanging fruit, and we're going to go after the low-hanging fruit, but I want us to climb up in the tree. Okay. That fruit's really good up there, so let's do it. Um, well, one thing we can do, the first thing we can do is set that emissions reduction target. And I think it's just like those folks on The Biggest Loser. You know, that's, that's what they're doing. They're, they're setting a target for themselves. And you, if you don't try to intend to do something, chances are you don't do it. So um, challenge ourselves, like the University of Montana, like Bozeman, like Helena, to, um, to, to get a handle on these emissions, to, to reel that that, um, that, that growth curve in emissions and costs back down. Um, so we suggest that the way to do it is to um, uh, give me a break and you know, come together, get a whole bunch of folks together and, and figure out how to, how to get this done, to form a climate uh, uh, action task force. Um, and there's a lot of folks with a lot of expertise. There's a lot of folks with a lot of um, uh, interest in this. There's, there's the greenhouse gas team, there's the mayor's team, and I think what it's time to do is for the city, the different parts to come together and say, let's, let's tackle this, let's work on this together, let's provide some resources for it if need be too. Um, so um, one of the things we discovered, and we would never, I would never wish doing what we did on My Worst Enemy to try to figure out how to, to inventory all the city's emissions. And if you want to be able to be, uh, to have, you need an essentially accounting system to know, are you reducing those emissions? Um, are, you, are you getting to where you want to go? And it's really not that hard if you just have, I'm not an accountant, but gosh, there must be a way to, to put all those bills that come in into a single spreadsheet, to code them by what department or what sector they are, and um, I can, uh, you know, I can, I can help with that, but I don't want to do it again. Um, <laughs> and so um, one thing that the University of Montana is considering is a four-day work week um, and a work at home. I think some departments are experimenting with this. Uh, can, that would reduce commuting. It would also um, reduce the energy consumption of buildings. Um, how can you do that without reducing services that people want? Um, that's something that obviously um, a lot of stakeholders need to be involved in. Um, creating a revolving energy loan fund, I think something like that might be in the works. But the biggest problem you hear from city government, from individual small businesses, from 
uh, property owners is that, gosh, I'd love to put in a new furnace, or I'd love to put in an on-demand water heater, I'd love to put in, you know, some, whatever it might be, windows, um, but I, don't, I can't do the upfront cost. And tax breaks are great, but I'm not going to put it all on my credit card and wait a year and a half to get paid back. So um, a revolving energy loan fund um, solves that problem by making funds available to um, what I would say is that it should be available to the city to do its, its clean up its house and then we can move on to help um, small businesses out or whoever, maybe do it side by side, um, you know, so that everyone's kind of joining in on the fun. Um, we think that renewable energy um, partnerships are possible too. Uh, the University of Montana is exploring that um, in, in quite a bit of um, uh, gusto uh, right now. Uh, particularly around biomass and um, ways to possibly bring uh, uh, Smurfit Stone facility back online to provide energy uh, for um, Missoula and, um, and or other places. Um, Swan has been talked about, there's been talking about, at least at the university, um, adding to the power plant that's there, a small biomass. So um, this could be a way to um, meet multiple social purposes and kind of address that triple bottom line. Um, but it does take a lot of effort, and I think that um, there needs to be a way to uh, encourage and reward city officials and, and department heads to devote energy and resource to, to, to exploring those things. Um, bringing in um, NGOs who have experience with um, renewable energy or our businesses that do would be great as well. So um, I'm wondering too, this is sort of a, an idea that I think is going to take some time, but a municipal energy bond or um, would that be something um, that Missoula is ready for? We've shown great support for a open space bond and you know that money is not getting spent real fast and I was wondering if there was two or three million dollars lying around for energy projects that was a loan, say, a, it could be used to, to, to fund a, a re renewable energy loan fund. Boy, I, I think there'd be a lot, of, a lot of interest in that. Um, it would take a lot of work, I think. I think the City Green Blocks program could be a good uh, beginning to build a, a constituency for that. Um, establish renewable energy certificates and carbon offsets program. Kind of gone on along. I'm going to leave that to maybe questions if people are interested in that. And I want to wrap up um, by saying just a few more things. Let that go too. <laughs> oh, let that go. Um, so there's some things Missoula is doing right for sure. Um, we've um, had a number of resolutions on municipal buildings, on the fuel, on um, energy, starting this renewable energy certificates program. Uh, next. There are all sorts of different programs that many of you are involved in and know about that um, and um, interest in sort of um, the, um, in the general citizenry too. So all these things are happening. And I, what I'm saying is that we can build on these things. We can, we can just bump it up a notch, if you will, next, and um, recognize that there's a cost to inaction. People might ask, well, what's the cost of doing it? There's a cost in action. And increasing energy costs are one of those costs. The threats to the things we care about are another cost. Next. And so local solutions build on these efforts that are already underway. They, um, they um, you know, we can, we can, if we're going to do this, we need to worry about staffing and funding needs to, to make it happen. Uh, we need to think about public-private. We need to get the movers and shakers and the technical people out there and the policy wonks all kind of on the same room in the same, uh, on the same table solving these, these issues. So um, in terms of moving forward, what we found, okay, slow down a little. Um, <laughs> what we found is that, you know, that steps towards sustainability do re require planning, that you just don't make it happen with one little project and, hey, let's do this, hey, let's do that but they require policy. They require us deciding, hey, we're gonna change the way we do things. Um, these cities have, have shown that, next. Um, but these initiatives have been less successful when they've been done in a piecemeal way. We've got a building thing, we've got a, a loan fund, we've got a green blocks, we've got this and that. And 
what the cities that have been most successful at really grappling and really handling these problems have integrated all of these efforts into a bigger sustainability um, framework. And so that's the last thing I leave you with next, is how can we have um, recognized that climate solutions will need sort of a, um, a more comprehensive approach and can we do it in a way that we don't see these things as competing with other agendas that, that are in the city. And so how can we, can we, can we um, find win-win situations? So I think that um, was all I have. I didn't get all the references on it. If you want the references, I can send them to you. Yeah. This is fabulous. I work for city government, so I'm quite fascinated by watching your, your presentation. What is particularly intriguing to me, though, is when we think about the valley, which kind of contains all of, for example, air pollutants, they come from a whole lot of sources, not just municipal government. Do you have a sense what what kind of a portrait we have for the community as a whole? Are we are we increasing our, our greenhouse gas uh, contributions at uh, a comparable rate to that which the local government is, or? Are we do you have any intuition at all? I wouldn't like wager a guess because I'm a, I'm a data guy and I like to see the numbers before I, you know, can say. Um, but, you know, I think uh, the university is a big chunk of our community, right? And so we're, uh, the university is increasing its emissions partly because enrollment is increasing, partly because new buildings are being added, have been added. And so, um, but municipal government is, is higher than that. But I think it really boils down to those two aquatic rec recreation facilities ultimately. And you know what I, I don't want to say about them is that um, we shouldn't have our kids go swim. <laughs> you know? But I think when we build those things, we should be thinking about um, what are the impacts to our um, emissions uh, as, a, as a community and uh, figuring out ways that we can um, mitigate those or reduce them. Um, I heard that they've looked into having solar water on whichever one it is, splash or, or, or um, um, and that the building itself structure can't handle the weight of that. So, um, you know, gosh, if it had been built to accommodate renewable energy, so if we can think of when we design things of making them adaptable to having renewable energy be part of the picture, even if we can't afford it now, that would be one simple thing that would, would uh, that a green buildings policy, for example, would do. And so green buildings policy do more than say, hey, you know, well, we're going to make sure to look at when we do retrofits new buildings that are going to be this way. The University of Montana is committed to a green buildings policy. Any new building has to be LEED certified. Now, I know there's a lot of debate as whether that's the best thing for this climate and, you know, but what, what is there then? Show me what that is and let's do it, you know, because um, when you add population, uh, you're adding services, you're adding buildings, and so um, I think it, that local government should try to do better than the community as a whole, and should set an example. So that's, um, if I had, if I knew how we were doing as a community as a whole, that's actually the next step. One of the one of the next steps that's supposed to be done is a, a community-wide um, greenhouse gas inventory. So um, that would be a great thing to do, so we we could know. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, what was in that 2004 plan, um, and have those things been implemented? I haven't really carefully looked at whether they have. I think some of them have. I think it set a number of things in motion. Um, and uh, some of them still haven't been implemented, I'm pretty sure. So, you know, it's great to have plans are great, um, implementation is tougher. And uh, so, uh, but I think what needs to be done is a larger constituency and a larger group of people be engaged in, in solving these problems because we, we, we need to bring the best minds and the best people together with that, that know really how to, how to do these things. I'm, I'm not, I can help. I'd love to be involved, but uh, you know, all of you are are folks that, that I think could really help with that. So um, I would invite us all to kind of um, encourage you know Mayor Engen and City Council to take this report and um, take the next step for for Missoula. Yeah. I, I 
might be just barking up the same tree before, but that older plan, you said, it did do a sort of a rough back of the envelope kind of total community mm -hmm. calculation. Mm -hmm. Is there any way, a very rough, rough estimate sort of level to understand, so your, you know, your total for the municipal part mm -hmm. would be 30%, 60%? Oh, it would be a small fraction. Okay. It would be a small fraction, yeah. Because think of all the houses well, that's what and I'm all the, you know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's tiny. So the residential and commercial would be too big. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and all just all the vehicles. Mm -hmm. And that plan's available online. So if you go to the city website and you search around for boards and commissions, you can find the greenhouse gas energy team. And that's available on there. I guess in terms of, you know, why city government matters too is that you know, we all have control of our houses. We can do things that we can do with our own houses and um, vehicles and choices of where we live and whatnot. But um, the city is ours. You know, the city government is our government, and it's um, something that, if it doesn't do a good job, it's not Pam's fault. It's not, um, you know, uh, oh, it's Pam's fault. Let's blame Pam. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not Mayor Engen's fault. You know, it's us, it's our government. And so I guess, um, you know, there's a lot of good folks working for the city that are really trying really hard. They have a lot of, a lot of work on their plate already. And so, you know, how you do this without having it be an add-on, I don't know. And that's why I'm pretty convinced that there needs to be an office, an energy office or a sustainability office that that's how it happened at UM. We fought tooth and nail to get a sustainability coordinator. Hey, guess what? We got one. We got one. We got a, a climate action plan. There was no, you know, mysterious connection between those two. You know, when you have someone that can dedicate time to working on these things, um, now, you know, the increase in energy costs is 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 for the city in five years is in the seven digits. So how, that would pay a few salaries, yeah. So, you know, it's like you got to be smart about, oh, it's going to cost money. Well, it's going to save money, you know. So I think we need to kind of look at the ledger and say, what are the costs and benefits of taking action? And I'm trying to bring up, you know, what are some of the costs of not, 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 of not acting? I think they're pretty substantial. One more question. Why not the embodied energy of all the materials, like the asphalts and the concrete? Because uh, I had four, I had six people working on this, and uh, they had other classes, and they're graduating. And um, yeah. but I think it would be great, another great project. You know, um, see if there was. I mean, do those things that you did not look at? Do you have a sense that that might even be a huge chunk, or those are more? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that much about paving. Uh, material and uh, uh, you know it's a petroleum product um, it certainly stinks when they put it down <laughs> and so um, something's something's going on <laughs> so you know look I'm I'm learning this stuff I, I got I got us this far um, those of you who know about this stuff please get involved and take in the next steps and I'd be happy to join you SBC wants to thank you for being here, and here's sure, a thank you. tote to take to the market. Okay, that should reduce my emissions. There you go. <laughs> and I would just like to personally comment, I've sat on the Sustainable Campus Committee at the University of Montana with Robin, and you could not have a more ardent advocate on behalf of the community of Missoula. When our climate action plan was in the developmental stages, he was the one that said, we are not going to set these you know, esoteric limits way out in the future. We want 100% reduction. We want it by 2020. We're going to set solid numbers. We're going to set very visionary objectives. And um, so we have, a, we have a wonderful driver here in the seat. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that.